Welcome to Islam, People and Power on the BBC World Service. I'm Safa Al Ahmed, journalist and documentary maker. In this series, I've been talking to people across the Arab world about a battle of ideas that's been raging since the uprisings began in 2010. Discussions that had once been taboo were suddenly possible. Before the revolution, I didn't know there's a lot of different schools of thought. Things became clear after the revolution. In a region where Islam is the dominant faith, Muslims have been debating what role Islam should play in government and whether rebelling against an oppressive ruler is a religious obligation or a sin. I've talked to Sunnis and Shia, ordinary citizens and top Islamic clerics from across the region. For this, the final episode of Islam, People and Power, I'm back in the BBC in London, where I'm joined by three experts on the Arab world. What impact do they think the debates of the moment will have on the future? My first guest is Professor Hazem Qandil of Cambridge University. He's a political sociologist with particular expertise on the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Hazem. The Arab uprisings, they gave you a unique opportunity as an academic. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I was very interested in studying the inner logic of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and of course, the revolutionary period was uh, a period that helped many members start questioning things, reflecting on things, which, which I think was very useful to be able to understand relations within the movement uh, and, and the internal logic by which it functions. The Arab uprisings also changed life of my next guest. Uh, Dr. Amha Azam was for many years an associate fellow at Chatham House, specializing in the Middle East and political Islam. But she now has an organization called the Egyptian Revolutionary Council. Uh, Maha, what does the Egyptian Revolutionary Council do? The Egyptian Revolutionary Council is opposed to the military regime. It opposes it outside Egypt. It has connections with those on the ground in Egypt. It believes in civil disobedience and calls for peaceful resistance uh, to the political regime in Egypt, uh, military dictatorship, and we call for a civil democratic society in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, let me introduce my final guest, Hassan Hassan, a resident fellow at Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy in Washington, D.C., and he focuses on Iraq and Syria. He joins us on the line from the United States. Uh, Hassan, have uh, the Arab uprisings changed your life like with our other two guests? Uh, certainly, I think, uh, and it happened over two phases. The first one was the beginning of the Syrian uprising in my country, in my area, in, in March 2011, and the immense repression and violence that happened over the next uh, years. Uh, the next one was in 2014, when ISIS, the Islamic State, started rolling into my own area in eastern Syria. And the Islamic State still controls the town where I come from. And for many reasons, uh, this has become a, a, a kind of a personal quest intellectually, uh, trying to understand why uh, people join these organizations, how these organizations, despite the savagery and, and violence, manage to control a large area spanning from Fallujah to Kurdistan all the way to eastern Aleppo. And uh, that brings us uh, to what we want to talk about. Firstly, we've tried to show in this series the schism that the uprisings caused not just between Islam's main sects, but within them. Uh, here's a reminder of what happened in Islam's largest group, the mainstream Sunnis. When the uprising spread to Egypt, I distinctly remember being in the car, driving towards Tahrir Square, and on the radio, the presenter was reading out a statement from Al-Azhar University, the most famous seat of Islamic learning. And it said, people should not protest against the government. It crystallized for me how disconnected the top scholars of Al-Azhar were from the people on the ground, including this former Al-Azhar student I met in Cairo. I love Al-Azhar, you know. But during my time, I do feel ashamed. I would feel very proud if the official statement and saying of the institution is, we support justice, we support going against tyrants, we support freedom, and this is what Islam is. Some of his teachers at Al Azhar went against the advice of the most senior scholars and joined the protest as well. 
lots of professors and sheikhs of Al-Azhar were encouraging all people to join. As that is in Tahrir Square, were wearing their formal clothes, like the garment and the turban of Azhari sheikhs specifically. And it was speaking about how Islam promotes justice and, and equality and equity and speaking about all what's happening from a religious aspect. In Syria, there were internal rifts between the country's Sunni clerics too. The man who was probably Syria's most well-known Islamic scholar, Sheikh Ramadan al-Buti, said that revolution was forbidden in Islam, a line he stuck to even as the brutality of the Syrian regime became more obvious as it shot dead protesters. Some of al-Buti's friends and fellow scholars were appalled by his stance. He couldn't see that people really were oppressed and people rebelled just because of the oppression. He didn't see that. He lost his soul because of his attitude. The Sunni scholars who spoke out against al-Assad had to flee the country. Some backed armed groups, others did not. None called the conflict in Syria a jihad. Sheikh Ramadan al-Buti was assassinated in a mosque. So can I start with... uh, the big question here that we're trying to answer. Did the religious scholars play an important role in the uprisings in 2010, Dr. Hazan? Well, the thing is, traditional Islamic jurisprudence places great emphasis on the fact that trying to unseat an unjust ruler can possibly lead to more violence and bloodshed, the magnitude that we see in Syria and Libya and Yemen. They look around them, they see those oppressive regimes in possession of formidable force and the support of important regional and international players. And they reach the conclusion uh, that an attempt to remove that evil is going to lead to a greater evil. And this is where their admonitions against revolt comes from. But don't you think that stance... Uh, disconnected those religious scholars from the youth on the ground that had already made that decision that there needs to be revolution. Uh, Dr. Maha. Certainly, uh, the, the, the gap is uh, huge between those on the ground fighting for change and uh, those uh, religious, uh, I'll call them religious officials, that ultimately were giving uh, support to regimes that were oppressing their people. And I think we need to think of them as state officials. And they have been state officials for a very long time. Mm. And of course, there's a rift with uh, with other religious scholars that oppose this. So there is a division among the religious and learned elite. Mm-hmm. And uh, did that predate... Uh, the nationalization. It is very true uh, that there is a tradition in Islamic jurisprudence of maintaining peace, uh, peacefulness, of not revolting against the ruler because you don't want chaos. But the role of the ulama, those men of religion in resisting French occupation and colonialism is known in the Arab world. Uh, They've always played a powerful and important role in maneuvering and supporting resistance. It is no different today and there were always those men of religion that supported the establishment and the ruling elite. I don't think there has been a major change. Uh, The only major change today is that you have the peoples of the region themselves revolting and standing up and saying that we do want change and knowing that the religious leaders have played an active role in supporting uh, the establishment. But it isn't new. It isn't new. Hassan, Hassan, what do you think in Syria and specifically in your region? uh, What role uh, did the religious scholars uh, play in your opinion? I think uh, they they played a negative role in terms of the, the fact that many of the uh, religious clerics were seen as uh, standing by the regime and supporting the status quo. We have to remember that the Arab uprisings were essentially a, a revolution or uprising against uh, not only the political elites, but also the religious elites, you know, the kind of the status quo, the establishment. And when uh, these clerics failed to respond to the uprisings and the uh, aspirations of young people, they lost uh, credibility. And that 
created a vacuum that groups uh, like Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS and others uh, exploited and told people, look, the only people who can present a change is us. Mm. And so are the religious establishment clerics aware of the danger that they have now, where if they continue to speak out in support of the established regimes and dictatorships, that now radicals like Al-Qaeda and Daesh or ISIS w- win the day? Well, I'm afraid that the clerks have uh, learned the wrong lesson from uh, from what happened over the past few years. Uh, if anything, now they think uh, standing by the status quo is actually better and more effective. And many people who supported uh, the political establishment in their country uh, feel uh, vindicated uh, by what happened in Libya and Syria and, and other countries. Mm. Dr. Hazem, you want to say? Well, religious scholars have to say what they believe, regardless of whether this allows them to win the ground. Now, I cannot speculate about their motives. I think part of the mistake they committed was that if they had simply explained to the people that in their own interpretation of religion, you should not set out to remove an oppressive regime without having a realistic perspective at supplanting it with a better alternative and then left it for those on the ground to decide whether there is such a possibility. I think they would not have caused so much disillusionment uh, amongst the youth. Uh, But I think they transgressed the boundaries of their specific specialty, which is jurisprudence, uh, by also speculating that there is no realistic political possibility Mm -hmm. of, of causing change and conflating the role of a religious scholar and that of a political analyst, I think was a mistake. You're listening to Islam People in Power on the BBC World Service with me, Safa Al Ahmed. In this, the final edition of the program, I'm joined by three experts from the Arab world. Professor Hazem Qandil from Cambridge University, who's an expert on the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Dr. Maha Azam, a former Chatham House expert on the Middle East and now heads the Egyptian Revolutionary Council. And on the line from Washington, D.C. is Hassan Hassan, an expert on Iraq, Syria and ISIS. Um, I would like to turn now to the question of a Muslim state in the region. A lot of people might expect that the Islamic clerics would be pushing for a creation of a theocratic state. But one of the most striking things for many people when we're doing this series is how little support there was among top Muslim scholars for such a state. This is what Dr. Uh, Abbas Shuman, a senior cleric uh, and scholar in the Lazhar University, told me when I was in Egypt. أولا يجب أن نذكر شيئا مهما أنه ليس لدينا في الإسلام Firstly, we don't have what is called an Islamic state in Islam. We here in Al-Azhar don't recognize the religious state. The ruling systems are that of a civil authority kind. It's a contractual relationship which is different in different places and times. So there is no specific set system. Dr. Abbas Shuman, a senior cleric. So, Hazem. Can you explain to me why top religious scholars would not want a theocratic state like in Saudi Arabia or in Iran? The dominant model in in most of Islamic history was that of clerics um, playing a role in public life. So they saw themselves more as what we today would call public um, intellectuals um, that would advise, counsel, admonish the leader and interact with the people and shape their um, religious worldview. And this is why they reject this notion that there was an Islamic state understood as a theocratic state where religious scholars actually get to participate in... Or rule rule directly. In rule. Yeah. So uh, what do you think, Dr. Amaha? Why do you think that religious scholars wouldn't want a theocratic state? Uh, I read things more politically. I think that a lot of the religious elite will be uh, opposed to this idea because they are also connected to these regimes and don't want the institution of any kind of state that is different to the one that exists. Mm. So because the status quo gives them a lot of power anyway. Yes, it gives the, it gives them power, but I think it's a matter of also a status, uh, and they are protected by these regimes, and they serve these regimes. Mm-hmm. Hassan, Hassan, I think uh, this is an important uh, question when it comes to Syria at the moment, because for a lot of people, we're talking about Daesh or ISIS on the ground and uh, the so-called Islamic State. What what are your thoughts on the ground in Syria? This is a, there's no evidence of this, as in we don't know for for one hundred percent that uh, clerics don't want uh, to live under an Islamic state. 
but as Professor Hazem said, uh, they have a model and they have to comply with this model that has existed over centuries, which is that you don't oppose a certain ruler. So uh, loyalty is an, uh, is an important thing. But another aspect, I think, uh, when, it, when it comes to clerics is that uh, the concept of uh, uh, governance uh, or ruler uh, or uh, imamat, as we say in Arabic, is not a fundamental part of Islam. It's a branch of the Islamic uh, religion. So if you don't have kind of a caliphate or an imamate, uh, you can still be a Muslim. But for ISIS and other strands of Islam, modern especially, uh, probably that also applies to political Islam, they don't believe that. They actually believe that imamate or the pledge of allegiance to a, a, a kind of a ruler is a fundamental part of Islam. Yeah, and, and that brings us uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood. Because uh, th this is the essence of what they believe, yes? So uh, the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, who are the largest social and political movement in the Arab world, they do believe in the creation of an Islamic state or Islamic states. Uh, their motto is, uh, Quran is our constitution. They were, of course, elected to government in Egypt, but they were deposed by a military coup after just a year. Now they are classed as terrorists and many have fled the country. One of the most striking moments for me while I was making this program was uh, to encounter a disillusioned young Muslim Brotherhood uh, member who is now in exile in Istanbul. And we'll hear a little bit of my conversation with him. So where are you? Where are you from all this? Of course, there is no longer political means for the youth. There is only the tool of revolution. This is the only way to face the institution like the police and the army. Revolution, there is no other alternative. Ha have, have some youth come to that conclusion that armed resistance against uh, the Ministry of Interior is something legitimate? For sure, yes. There are real justifications for resistance, moral justifications, religious and even political justifications. People resort to revolution when there is nothing left on the horizon through gradual, peaceful reform. People start with the less harmful option and then escalate. I think at this point in Egypt, the level of force of resistance and revolution will increase. But the transformation of a popular revolution to an armed one, like in other places, is not possible at the moment. But if the situation continues, will that escalate? God only knows. Dr. Hazem, your opinion? Um, you know, you, you have to take into account what has been going on in the region as a whole. You know, the rise of, of, of Daesh, um, the destruction of a number of Arab regimes, as oppressive as they were, creates the opportunity um, for, for the spread of, of militancy. Um, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised that in, in this situation of, of fluidity, people believe that a more aggressive attitude can afford them certain gains that they would not have hoped to um, achieve in a more stable situation. I mean, fr from me talking to many across the region, it, it, it's not only that it can, that it's the only way forward because of the failure and the belief of political process can bring reform. And this was the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and uh, and in Syria as well and in Yemen, across the board, because the regimes were so repressive. Uh, the youth have lost the faith that the revolution that they started can actually produce the outcome that they wanted. And, and thus violence and extremism is one of the few spaces left for them. Dr. Ramaha, what do you think? I think we need to put it in a little bit more perspective. When we're speaking about the Muslim Brotherhood, we're talking about a political and social organization that has had people that have left and gone towards violence. But the organization as a whole and its leadership has been committed to nonviolence. And I think the biggest challenge to regimes, if we try to tie things together, has been that this organization does represent a challenge that combines Islam and the belief in electoral politics or democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Hassan Hassan, now we're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and their belief in Islam as a solution and it's integral to how they believe a state should be run. And then we have a country like Saudi Arabia. And you would assume that kind of, there would be natural alliances be between those two groups. But in reality, Saudi Arabia has great animosity towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Hassan, can you explain why Saudi Arabia and the Muslim Brotherhood in the region don't get along? 
One of the uh, f- former uh, officials of uh, Saudi Arabia said that uh, the Brotherhood are, are, are the uh, kind of uh, incarnation of evil. Uh, basically, he, sa- he said they are the worst. And uh, Can you explain why, though? I mean, for people uh, who don't know anything of the machinations of, of the region, this sounds really weird. Uh, The Muslim Brotherhood played a a very important role uh, in the 80s and early 90s in Saudi Arabia and across the Gulf. Uh, These were uh, expatriates uh, who left Egypt and went to teach uh, or work uh, in the Gulf. And they had immense influence, but that kind of influence uh, was later understood by Saudi Arabia to be a threat. They started to see the Muslim Brotherhood and and their activism and the change they demanded uh, in the Gulf as, as a threat. So they started to kind of roll back the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood and that happened in Saudi Arabia, that happened in Oman and the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Amaha, you wanted to say? Uh, The Brotherhood, um, even till now, do not oppose Saudi Arabia. But I believe that Saudi Arabia sees um, the Brotherhood as a challenge, um, not so much because of the reasons that we just expressed, but because I think, again, because of that combination where the Brotherhood represent an Islam that is traditional, that is Sunni, uh, and that combines that with a call for accountability on the part of the ruler and greater participation on the part of the people. And that remains the main challenge uh, of the Brotherhood to the Gulf states and the rulers of the Arab world. And that is why the Brotherhood uh, is seen as so threatening, because it, ha- it is a lethal combination, a religion uh, plus uh, uh, an ability to accept the electoral process and the democratic process. Yes. And that is extremely active. And that is particularly worrying to rulers. Yes. Do, you, do you agree, Professor Hagen? Well, Wahhabism and Islamism are two different things. Um, Islamism, as, as a modern 20th century ideology, is something completely novel. The idea here is that when you create a moral community, political and military success and economic prosperity follow. Um, thereby, it becomes the ruler's primary objective uh, to promote and protect uh, public piety as a way of his own political, economic, military success. Now, this very novel interpretation presents a a very different model than uh, many traditional clerics in Saudi Arabia and outside uh, believe that that relationship between religion and and society should be. And therefore, for the Muslim Brotherhood, since the state has so much sway over shaping public morality in in, in their view, then it becomes the the target um, for promoting and protecting a a pious community. Mm. So if, uh, if we bring this uh, program to a close, for for th- all three of you, where do you see the future of Islam, people in power? Hazim? Well, I can't, I can't predict the future, but I can project from the past. And, um, you know, I reflect on the history of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I find that their prominence um, was invariably linked to them being serviceable in some way to rulers. And I guess if they can impose themselves... Uh, on the ruler, if they can fight their way back to the political arena against the wishes of the ruler, it will be a first, um, certainly. Because as, you're not optimistic. Well, well, their history. Well, I'm not again. I, I can't predict the future, but their history shows that they usually overcome every wave of repression when the new ruler finds some use to them. Uh, and I'm not sure whether again this will be a first. Whether they'll fight their way back into the political arena against the wishes of the ruler, against the interests of the ruler, or will they continue in the same cycle uh, that we've seen in the past eight decades? Mm. Hassan, Hassan. I think it's it's a, some version of Salafi jihadism that is going to influence both the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, like uh, you know uh, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, Salafists, and I think that will be the the change in the future. Whether this trend will be uh, more and more violent or uh, more realistic, that would be an open question. Hmm. Who within Salafism do you think uh, it, it pops to mind when you when you say this? Who who represents that for you? Okay, so Muhammad Surur uh, is an example. He is uh, a person who had an immense influence in Saudi Arabia and throughout the region who combined uh, revolutionary ideas and injected these uh, revolutionary ideas into Salafism uh, or the other way around. He, he died this November. 
he went unnoticed in uh, Western media, but he has had an immense influence in the region. And uh, many people took uh, from him and uh, they also added his ideas. There are people like Muhammad, Abu Muhammad al maqdisi he's a, a Jordanian ideologue who also advocates this combination between Salafism and uh, Islamism. Mm-hmm. Dr. Amaha? I certainly agree that there is a, a dynamism that is connected to revolutionary thought uh, uh, combined with Salafism that is very influential. But I believe that the main players are those in power and large groups and uh, influential groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood. But the issue for the peoples of the region is to end corruption, to, re- to end the abuse of power and to seek a fairer and more just society. That doesn't mean it has to be a democratic society for all. Some believe that it shouldn't be democratic, but the vast majority were willing at a certain point after 2011 to experiment and accept democracy. I believe that urge is still there, uh, but the struggle is not easy. The backbone of that struggle remains the more moderate Islamist movements that have opposed military regimes and dictatorship for decades. And the issue today is that they're being repressed, their voices are not being heard, and the space is becoming increasingly filled by the radicals and those who want to resort to violence. Thank you all very much. To me, this is such a fascinating topic. Uh, so sorry, I think uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and hopefully the listeners as well. I would like to thank my guests, Professor Hazem Qandil of Cambridge University, Dr. Amaha Azam, previously of Chatham House, now head of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council, and Hassan Hassan from the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy in Washington, D.C. I'm Safa Al-Ahmed, and you've been listening to the last episode of Islam, People and Power. My producers of this series were Wesley Stevenson and John Murphy. My editor was Ennis Bowen. If you'd like to let us know what you think of this series, there is an easy way to do it. Just give a rating or leave a review on iTunes or your podcast provider. This program was part of a BBC World Service podcast called The Compass. We look forward to reading your comments. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.